Okay, so um, I sent out some emails to you guys before this reading tonight. Um, so there are some things I'm curious about, um, and I'm sure other people are, but I also, I wanna do this in a kind of interactive way, so I don't wanna be the only one asking questions. So I'm gonna throw out the three points I'm interested in hearing from you about, and please, uh, the rest of you pipe in, okay? Um, so the three things I wanna know about are what has the publication uh, process been like for each of you, um, how it's affected your life and your writing, um, what sort of networking did you have to do or other things to get published? Just, you know, maybe a little bit behind the scenes, uh, um, some idea about that. Also, all of you uh, either um, have families or are gonna start families. Uh, I'm curious to hear how uh, you are integrating your writing with your family life and other work, other jobs. Um, and I forgot what the third point was. What was my third point? Oh, how, how, do you, how do you keep your sense of humor and inspiration? So, who wants to start? Well, I'll, uh, um, where should I start? Uh, I guess with family, I, um, I was looking for them. I guess they're gone. Um, <laughs> which, uh, happens. Um, but uh, I was just talking to uh, Krista about um, Kristen and Tony about, um, I thought when I was thinking about having a child that I had to choose between writing and uh, having a kid, uh, which terrified me. I didn't want to make that decision. Um, and I don't think anyone should have to make that decision. But, um, but I found that, uh, you know, that's, I, it's hard, but I can make it work. Um, it sucks, I, you know, I have to get up earlier in the morning um, at 5 or 5.30. Um, you know, it also helps to have an understanding spouse who will give me some time to, uh, to write. But I guess, you know, if uh, you're thinking of having a family and you're a writer, um, it can be done. <laughs> and there's many better examples of, of me than that that can happen. where um, Josephine, my daughter, was uh, six weeks old when I sold my book. And um, my husband, uh, Tony, is also a writer, and um, he was in the last push of his uh, finishing his last book. And so we had a frantic house of writing and <laughs> no sleep. And, um, you know, we were getting acquainted with our, our new baby. And the thing that I learned was that it's possible, but it, it is really hard. And, um, I, I learned that um, all of those, you know, days and weeks and years where I procrastinated work, uh, were no long, it was no longer going to happen that way. <laughs> and it was an amazing feeling to be able to finally sit down and write again and feel like that was a luxury. And, I, you know, now I feel like I've engaged with work in a way that I feel like I'm allowing myself this luxury, the luxury of time and, and you know, sitting and writing feels much more that way. I mean, I don't know what happens when you have to write a second book, and I'm sure those sorts of feelings um, are, are very complicated, especially when you have a child, because a lot of energy is devoted into the child. You know, all of your nurture is there, and so I guess I'll get back to you on what happens next time. <laughs> yeah, I don't I always want to have kids yet, um, but I think there's a very strong possibility in your future, so um, I'm a little bit scared. Absolutely. You should. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all, my, all my siblings have, like, your story, you read multitudes of children. So, like, you know, I'm always around little kids, but um, I think part of it is the, the book that I'm working on now, the, the nonfiction criticism book, would, I would never do that when I have kids. It is literally just too much. Little things and time and stuff like that. But poetry, I think is because it's a, a spur kind of art, it's something that can be created in small bursts. I can see myself in like the three seconds I might have during a day writing part of a draft of poem. So it's definitely something I'm nervous about, for sure. Yeah. But I think, as you can see, it's, it's possible. What about the road to publication? Any gems any of you can share? 
about getting there, about now being there, how that's affected your work? Um, well, I think um, getting there, that, that was the hardest part because you have to you know, have <laughs> this book that is presentable. And, you know, the, the, road, the road was long in that way, and it was much sort of less difficult than I thought to actually have it put in the right hands. I'm, I was I was kind of dreaded that, and I think that the good news, at least in my story, was that it didn't take a bunch of you know networking and cocktail parties to find the right agent, mm -hmm. and for that agent to put that book in the hands of the perfect editor. And I was very lucky that way. You know, I, I, I did I did what they tell you to do. I found agents who represented writers that I thought I you know. Um, I had something in common with, and I sent out my queries, and it didn't take very long that I, you know, I found the right one. And Nick and Kevin, I think uh, you guys said something similar about how you start, you start out getting your individual pieces published, and then you just followed up with presses whose work you liked and was a good fit, and right? I think what Chris has said about making sure you know who you're interacting with, sort of the research ahead of time, I think is equally important for finding a publisher, especially for books of poetry. Um, a lot of first books of poetry, or a lot of people think that first books of poetry have to be contest kind of winning you know, manuscripts, but it really doesn't have to be that. I think um, I happened to contact uh, my publisher, Old Week, sort of just at the right time for the first one, and the second one was basically a solicit, and um, you know, it, it's that was what you know, and that, I'm extremely thankful for that. And I think finding what a press wants and finding what they publish and along the way supporting other writers and writing reviews and sort of understanding that kind of contemporary scene will help you make a little more of an informed submission. I know if you send things out just blind, you can get really sad because you're just, you know, nobody answers them. You know, it's kind of like yelling to the dark. So, you know, but I think you know, if you research that, you give yourself a strength. Okay. And so now that you guys are all uh, published or about to be published, um, how has that affected your work? if it has? Well, for me, I, uh, it's given me even more motivation because now I have a, a publisher that knows my work. And um, so it, uh, it, getting up at 5 in the morning becomes easier because I really want to get the next thing published or at least ready to, uh, to send out. Um, it's also you know, there's some pressure in that sense, but it's, uh, it's even more motivation. And I didn't anticipate that uh, aspect. Because it's, it becomes a real <laughs> thing, you know, and I think, uh, I think it, it can drive you in a different way than, than before. Um, and I think being busy helps because I know, like, the little time that I have is, like, it's like golden. Like, I, I, I want to pounce on it. Yeah, for me, uh, the the thing that I um, that I've learned, you know, with the, the with you know the publication of her um, is that working with an editor is the sort of magically collaborative experience. I mean, it's very much my book; it is my book. But to have her hands, you know, on the book and to be able to trust her and to be working, you know, beside a woman who. Well, it's a memoir, so she so intimately knows my life and who's motivated to kind of try to help me tell the story in the best way and sort of the most universally good way that she can. That's been that's been an amazing experience and one that I, you know, I didn't necessarily expect to have. And I guess the good news about that is that it's changed the way that I I, um, I think that I work because I'm I'm writing, you know, I'm writing knowing that she's going to read it, but also I'm the things that I'm thinking about writing are also kind of they're 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 in the conversations that we're having in this book now, you know. So I, I'd say maybe this should go in here, and Barbara will say, "Well, there's this next book that you should do." So right. you know, like I was really surprised to learn that the relationship to actually, like what Kevin said, could be much bigger than that just one book. So I was going to follow up with, "Are you already thinking about your second book?" Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah I am. Okay. Yeah. I haven't started it yet. Questions? Come on, I don't want to pull teeth like I do with my students. <laughs> I can't wait, but the uh, question is, uh, are all the law firms here working in New York Metropolitan Park? 
My publisher is from Boston, uh, Massachusetts, so, uh, and then my the nonfiction publisher is actually from Oregon. So mm -hmm. we're in this like, theological country, so um, yeah, it's kind of all over the place in terms of, I think with small press poetry, it's, it, there is a New York City, I mean, Brooklyn, there's a bunch for that, but um, they are scattered you know, throughout. In the mountains of Texas, which is a big flash fiction area. I'm <laughs> You guys are all from the tri-state area, though. Do you consider yourselves regional writers at all, or no? Yeah, I think, well, I, I grew up in a military family, so I, there would be too many regions. Right, it would be right. Very <laughs> My family's from Newark, and uh, I don't think I've really too much of it. I mean, not directly, but certainly culturally, I think it comes through. And, uh, but now I live in the country. So it's New Jersey, but not. So it's, I don't know what I'm doing out there, but it's fun. So, it's interesting influence. Yeah, that's a tricky term, regional writers, because you know, I'm not even uh, meaning to imply that you uh, identify with a particular region, but you all do happen to live and work in this region. So, um, other questions? Yes, Bonnie. Good question, because the other point I forgot was what impact did the MFA program have on you guys? So thank you, Bonnie. Um, yeah, because one of the points I wanted to uh, bring up was to ask them what, um, what impact the MFA program had on them and on their writing, so. We were all in the same class, so I remember reading. It's definitely, I mean, it was great to see things immediately and to see how they, they evolve. Um, and you don't get to see that anymore, which is sad. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I think um, I, I, the one thing that I miss about um, being in um, a workshop um, with um, the students here was just that I felt like there was a really sort of, um, you know, an amazing energy that surrounded people's work, and you know, it, it, uh, it was, and not not for me. I didn't I didn't need it as a motivation to get it done, but there was something about it that, it, you know, it gave me a little electrical charge. You know, where I felt like I knew who I knew who were, were going to be reading it, but and all, but also I think to be surrounded by people who are so you know busily and um, writing and invested in writing in that way, I think helped my work because. You know, it's, it's contagious to be surrounded by people who are, you know, investing themselves in that way. And, you know, to, for me, I'm lucky because my husband is a writer, and so I can have my own little, um, you know, two-person MFA workshop <laughs> for dinner. I wouldn't quite call it that, so I do still have that in my life. But, you know, it's, it's much different to have, you know, 15 people as opposed to just, you know, one. Yeah, I also miss the, uh, the workshop. I, you know, at the end of the MFA, I remember, uh, Jamie, you can appreciate this, like being sick of the workshop and just wanting it done, not wanting to be in a workshop ever again. Um, I don't know if that's the same. <laughs> but you, got, you don't have to admit it. But, um, but then, you know, so then, you know, you kind of, you go off on your own and you got to, you know, at the end of the day, I hate that expression, but um, eventually, you know, you're, you're by yourself and you're writing. Own, and you hope that some of the voices from workshop are still talking in your ear, you know, the ones that um, you wanted to listen to, they, they remain and they kind of tell you and guide you. But, you know, every now and then I think it's, it's cyclical. I yearn for a workshop again um, just to get back in that environment and then maybe back off and then maybe come back. So, probably maybe do another MFA. <laughs> Questions? For the guy, since you're a poet and you also write prose, I wonder if you write in both the genres at the same time, do you write a poem at 7 a.m. or write an essay at noon, or do you just work on one project at a time? If it's a good day, yes, but I actually think 
and, and people have said this, this, this sounds ridiculous, but I feel like a seasonal writer. Like in, in the summer, I want to write fiction. Um, like I'll sit in my shed and just write and write and write. And then in the winter, um, when it's cold, I can write poetry. It's just, it feels like the right time for it. Um, and I guess nonfiction is like the spring or something like that. But, <laughs> but definitely, yeah, it's interesting to, you know, it's, yeah, I have to catch myself sometimes from remembering that poetry is a separate world and, and what the expectations of the reader are. And, uh, but, but yeah, I think it is actually refreshing to jump between genres and between forms, uh, definitely reinvigorated. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? How are we doing on time, Bonnie? You're wrapping it up? Yeah, okay. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight to support these writers and um, alumni relations and the MFA program. And I hope you enjoy the rest of homecoming and the rest of your week. And let's just have another round for the writers. Thank you.